Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Myra Chen and I am your host for today's eLotus webinar. eLotus is your leading provider of continuing education for acupuncturists, where you can find over 3,000 hours of TCM information and 200 plus experienced speakers. Today's webinar is sponsored by Evergreen Herbs and we have three groups joining us. The first group is our WIF group who used the code to get free access to today's webinar. The video replay and CEUs are not available for you, but you can upgrade to our second paid group. Paid group attendees will be able to enjoy today's webinar, watch it as many times as they want for the next month, and earn CEUs. Finally, if you want to upgrade to Ultimate and Full Access, you can join our third group, which is our Gold Pass members. I'll go into more detail later today, but our Gold Pass members have free access to live webinars and distance learning courses for their duration of their membership. Today's webinar is Zhang Zhongjing Medicine, Fuzi Formulas, presented by Ivan Zavala. Before we begin, let's do a little housekeeping. Today's webinar will be from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time, and we will have one break. If you have not already, please get your copy of the lecture notes from the blue course access page in your account. If you would like to join the chat, please do the following right now. Set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing. You'll have to do this manually because the default setting allows only the speaker and the staff to see what you're writing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. Our speaker will answer the questions as time allows. The quiz and the video replay for paid and gold pass members will be both available tomorrow and you will receive an email notification when they are. Our speaker today is Ivan Zavala, who is the founder of Nirvana Acupuncture and specializes in autoimmune diseases and internal medicine. His interests as a Chinese medicine practitioner and professor are in treating severe and complex disease with direct insight and guidance from the Chinese medical classics. Ivan is passionate about communicating with other professionals about important medical concepts that underpin various historical eras of Chinese medicine. He has taught other herbal formula web webinars with us, so if you would like to more learn more from Ivan, please find his courses online now at elotus.org. Now, let's begin today's class and welcome Ivan Zavala. Okay, Ivan, please take over now and share your PowerPoint. Great, thank you everyone. Thank you, Ivan Zavala. We appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed today's class, we would appreciate it if you could share your experience on social media to help promote both our speaker and eLotus. As a reminder, the quiz and the video replay will both be available for paid and gold members tomorrow. And you'll receive an email notification when they are ready. Thanks again for joining us today and we will see you at the next webinar on January 10th, 2023, COVID-19 and TCM, Past, Present and Future with John Chen. Um, everybody can hear me well? Okay. Um, and we're going to have our break too, um, around an hour, an hour and 15, and that'll be for like 10 minutes or so, okay? Um, with that said, let us begin. Oh, and happy holidays, everybody. Um, uh, whatever you celebrate, um, wherever you're from, I wish you a happy, um, restful holidays, um, a, a little rest from patience, right? Anyways, um, let us continue. So, as we know, we're studying foods, uh, uh, formulas, uh, but primar primarily, sorry, what's happening? Uh, before the foods of formulas, we're going to study foods unto itself because you cannot use foods of formulas if you have an aversion to the main prescription, to the main herb. So, we will dissect foods. Uh, and we will try to get some knowledge of foods up. And then with that knowledge of foods, up, then we can begin to have a comfort with using foods up, uh, slowly, because I never would recommend uh, using foods up, uh, at a ways you're uncomfortable with if you're not experienced with it, right? Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more. 
but uh, using any toxic herb in Chinese medicine, and I use quite a bit of them, right? Um, and there's a recent book um, translated by an academic, uh, basically called Poisonous Plants or something like that. Um, it's a free source at one point he put it on. And there he talks about the history of toxic plants in, in China. And it's quite an interesting read. I mean, I haven't read it all, but I've kind of glimpsed through it. And it's quite an interesting read because you get to see the historical premises, the historical um, usages and utilization of this toxic medicinals. And from a clinical standpoint, this toxic plant sometimes uh, improve results quite rapidly because of the uh, potency that they offer, right? <clears throat> From a classical perspective, a lot of these poisonous plants, whether they be like the bugs, whether they be the toxic plants, they are in the from the Shenong Ben Sao Jing, right, which is the uh, oldest material medica that we have, right. There, there were probably other ones, but uh, that's the one we have. Though that's the oldest, you know, the Shenong Ben Sao Jing. For those that are aware categorizes the medicinals into three types of categories, the upper grade, the middle grade, and the lower grade, all right? The upper grade are said to basically uh, nurture kind of your, your, your mean, your, your, your destiny, your, or your life, right? And the middle grades, they kind of are in between. They nourish your, I forgot what they say, they nourish a specific aspect, but the lower grade herbs, those lower grade herbs treat being, they treat disease, they treat your essence, they treat your body, right? They're the ones that are necessary if you have a severe kind of illness. And Fuzza is what we call the sage of these lower grade herbs. So, um, so yes. Um, yeah, that book, Healing with Poisons. Uh, potent medicines in medieval China. Oops. Uh, so let us begin. Uh, let's begin to look at foods uh, from kind of uh, a standpoint of, sorry, uh, from a standpoint of uh, just kind of Western research from the from a botanical standpoint. So foods uh, or aconit has has a chemical is part, belongs to the aconitium species in the, how would you say this, the Ranunculaceae family or whatever. Well, there are various species depending on the region. The standardized focus in Chinese medicine is Aconitum uh, carmichaelis dev, uh, devix, or how you say that, and Aconitum uh, kusne safi. However, many other species have likely been used, right? For example, in Yunnan province, there are eight types alone of foods, right? Um, and of course, around the world, uh, there's all types of different foods of species. So here in the America, there's a f quite a few of them, but they're not the same as the ones from China, right? Now, it's interesting to know that while foods is a poison, like right, called wolf's bane, um, and historically, people have been poisoned by it. You know, there's a lot of cool stories about foods are being used as a poison, most cultures do have medicinal usages for it. Uh, for example, I learned from um, an Indian colleague that foods are there is used, aconite, because Indians actually, in Ayurvedic medicine, especially Siddhi, Siddhi medicine, they use quite a number of toxic medicinals, like heavy metal still, right? I'm not recommending that. And, but they use foods and they basically, you know, detoxify the, the plant and I think they say cow urine or something and to make it uh, safe or whatever. I don't know how that is uh, utilized or what's the process of that. But, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in Indian culture, obviously cow is a sacred uh, object or a sacred devotional uh, being. And so uh, its secretions can help detoxify poisons, right? So they use that. And I don't know, they, they use it for, in a certain way, 
a similar way the Chinese medicine uses it. Uh, although foods are, in Chinese medicine has more of an importance and we use it more for uh, people that are like vanquished yang qi. They use it for all types of things that are similar, like paralysis, hemiplegia, numbness, right? So uh, there's always going to be some, si some semblance of similarity in all cultures because uh, it's easy to observe when you give it medicinal, it has certain effects that are similar, even if the species is different because um, of its um, uh, similar chemical properties in some de degree. Uh, now, it's interesting to be aware that the medicinal properties largely come from the aconitine type uh, diatropine alkaloids, which can be cardio and neurotoxins. So first we're going to learn about the cardio neurotoxins. Um, so we are aware of them because the first thing we need to be aware of foods, uh, and I don't want to teach foods uh, without teaching you that it's not that it's toxic, okay? And once you understand that it's toxic, then you can use it uh, with a consciousness of safety. Um, so there are three types of, uh, of aconite in Chinese medicine. Primarily, there's fuzi, wu tuo, and tian shung, right, tian shung. The main one used uh, in the, is the aconitae lateris radix preparata, i.e. the prepared form of the appendage of the aconite um, plant. The primary plant of the though is wuto, right? What I mean is um, that's the actual kind of whole tuber of, of foods. Uh, and the lateral appendage of the plant is the foods. Uh, hence why wuto is kind of seen as the mother and foods uh, as, the, as the child, right? And here's a picture of kind of wuto in the, in the middle and, and kind of the whole tuber. And then you see kind of the appendage aspect of foods, right? Um, so it's kind of like, um, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> so yeah. And, and foods is kind of like, uh, I mean, kind of mnemonic to kind of understand, read this. The S in foods, uh, I mean, it means appendage, but the S also is kind of like, it has symbolic meanings in, in kind of, um, you know, in folklore of Chinese medicine, maybe in the academic, not so much, but in the folklore of his, of Chinese, the si, I mean, has many meanings, uh, but the si uh, is kind of like a child, right? So it's kind of uh, like it's the offspring of the wu tuo, right? Um, so yes. Um, and so here's a just like, once you are, the medicine is cultivated and uh, prepared and processed, here are just different forms of that you might see the foods. Uh, there's Tian Shong. Um, Tian Shong, uh, if, I be, if I'm correct, I believe Tian Shong is basically Wu Tuo that is aged at a certain uh, point, right? It's just like a five years old uh, wuto or something like that. Um, but I've never used Tian Shong because I've never seen it uh, be sold uh, here at least. So it's hard to get Tian Shong, uh, but maybe one of you has a resource. Um, and of course, all these medicines are basically pre processed to make them less toxic. Uh, for example, all this is the Tian Shong, right? Tian Shong. And there's a prescription in the Jingwe Yalue called Tian Shong San, Tian Shong San, in I think chapter five of the Jingwe Yalue, the, the chapter on um, blood bee and Shu Lao Shui Bi, Shu Lao Pian, right? The chapter on blood obstruction and uh, vacuity taxation. So here, and the prescription is Tian Shong San, right? Tian Shong San, and it's always contrasted to Gui Zhe Jia Lung Gu Tang. They're kind of like pairs of treating the same pattern in a different way. Um, but here Tian Shong, we see it uh, in different ways. So 
uh it can be this is kind of like the standard process one and then the here's the raw sheng tian sheng right the raw tian sheng and here is pao tian sheng kind of blast fried uh tian sheng uh, but again it's hard to and uh, hard to find that right and here the bottom one is the foods uh here we have salted foods here we have, and of course, you we salt it. Anytime we salt the medicinal and Chinese medicine, we're basically, uh, ent- I mean, salty, as we know from a theoretical standpoint, um, enters the kidney level, right? Enters the water layer. So in a certain way, it kind of helps nourish the kidney more, um, makes the medicinal more uh, supplementing or tonifying um, for the associated organ, right? And the shang fuzi. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using shang fuzi, although you could sort of get it if you know where to look. Um, and I have some myself, but I don't recommend using it uh, uh, for most uh, because uh, it's highly toxic. Although there are some doctors who use it, um, to be honest, especially those who train under the famous physician that we're going to look at, Ni Hai Sha. Ni Hai Sha used it. He practiced his Taiwanese doctor uh, who practiced in Florida, who specialized in all types of diseases, but especially treating and kind of curing cancers. And he was a big advocate to using raw foods. Um, Again, I will not recommend this. I'm just making you aware of it, okay? And some of his students, like Andy Lee from California, still use raw foods. Um, So, but again, I don't recommend uh, most people using it. Uh, So I'm just informing you that some people do use it uh, in a safe way because they know how to, they have experience with using it raw. And when I mean raw, I don't mean just the raw herb. In, in cooking it, I mean, without even being processed at all, because foods are usually processed in some way, even with the raw herb that we get. Then we have pao foods, and of course, that's blast or pao fu pian. That's also, pian means like a slice or a piece, right? So these are sliced in pieces, and you'll see the shang foods, uh, and even the, the salted foods, I think yan foods, uh, uh, yin foods, uh, is... Um, uh, more of bigger pieces, right? Uh, so that idea. Um, in addition, two different cuts of foods. Uh, um, in addition to other forms of, uh, of foods, uh, there's different ways to process foods. Uh, besides ji foods, uh, there's salted foods, uh, there's pao foods, uh, and additionally, there's also hay foods uh, and bai foods. Uh, um, and of course, Bai Fu Pian and Hei Foods, uh, which actually Heiner Fru have sells the different types of Hei Foods uh, and Bai Foods. Uh, hei Foods uh, means black foods, uh, Bai Foods uh, means white foods, uh, right? And they, so the salted foods, uh, the Ji Foods, uh, the Pao Foods, uh, the Hei Foods, uh, the Bai Foods, uh, all these foods uh, do something a little bit different, okay? Uh, but to be honest, I don't use salted foods uh, because um, I don't really get that. So, I mean, I will have to prepare myself and um, I don't know. I just don't do it. I use a lot of pao foods, uh, uh, hay foods, hay fu pian, and ji foods. Uh, that's what I primarily use in clinic myself. But um, Heiner will say bai fu pian and even Chinese sources will say use bai fu pian it's just to white foods are just to treat more expel wind for headaches and to raise yang chi. So it's almost like more to treat something external, okay? Hei fu pian, black foods are, is used to more rescue yang, right? Like uh, hui, hui jiu yang, right? To rescue and bring back yang. Uh, pile foods, uh, now that's better to warm the spleen Anything pow in Chinese medicine, roasted, usually makes the medicine a little bit more, uh, you know, more gentle, right? More moderate in nature. So when that has an effect more on the middle jowl, okay? And that's going to be helpful for, um, uh, 
kan det young deficiency spring young <coughs> TCM spring young deficiency with diarrhea right spring kidney young deficiency with diarrhea you know that diarrhea often ha happens in the morning what what did they call like the cockroach diarrhea right um okay. that's a sign of the young deficiency but of course you could have the diarrhea from a clinical standpoint at any time of day but it usually worsens a little bit at night because at night the yin grows right the night is known as tying time because tying uh is the time of great yin right at night uh people's yin the yin of nature uh increases so that means the yin in the body increases right so yes um somebody's um now as i said hay foods or hay food pian is not the same as jiff foods uh, uh they are both foods that uh, will prepare distinctly basically um i don't have the time to translate this the way that foods are pr uh, processed and i'm just giving you a a an overall a, a simplistic overarching uh emphasis or whatever um because my emphasis is not on the processing you could look that up my emphasis is on the clinical standpoint and we already have lots of slides so i'm not trying to go too much on the processing but basically to give an overview of the foods are first you remove the wugan uh or the mugan the mother root which is the wutho okay so first you remove the mother so you kind of have to separate the wutho first and then you kind of uh have to basically wash it or brine it or something and they use different substances to kind of wash the root and stuff like that um they use things uh they traditionally i think they kind of brine it or wash it or soak it over and over in some type of salty brine or something right um or some type of uh yeah some type of salty brine or something but now uh, the the problem is now they skip that process for faster uh processing and uh, you know heiner goes a big um uh goes a lot into this the modern problems with uh with foods up uh but basically now they use some type of alkali or i don't know what type of what it's made of honestly uh but when they use the alkali it kind of makes the foods a, a little bit more uh i don't know the, if it, it basically creates more side effects for the foods uh, because it's not um it's not prepared traditionally like they do in sichuan and stuff like that so when that happens the foods are begins to have more side effects it usually becomes more hot and toxic uh more hot and toxic so people when they start using foods uh uh the medicinal begins to give you more side effects so often like liver fire and stuff like that and not toxic that is going to basically harm you but it just doesn't do what you think foods is going to do um uh, additionally foods uh should be uh, what isn't done traditionally either is they basically uh pick it at the wrong time of year so foods are supposed to be picked in the summer but it's not right it's supposed to be harvested in the summer um and you know that's just part of the 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 dowdy or the or the deep dowdy i believe the the way of cultivating plants at a specific region and within that uh they have a uh, ways to harvest it when to harvest it, at what time or what equinox um and then at that time when to when to plant it uh when to harvest it and that has in chinese medicine uh and even even from a western standpoint an effect on the different chemicals found in the plant when at the time of harvest so it does have an effect but from a chinese medicine standpoint we're not necessarily worried about the chemicals inside the plant we're more necessarily uh, focused on the on the flavor and nature of the plant and the uh, nature consider changes because uh you have to understand that plants get hit by the sun at different times of the year and that sun basically makes the plant goes obviously from a uh 
to different photosynthesis or whatever makes the plant grow at different stages. And at the different stages, it's going to have different chemical constituents at different degrees. So, uh, so foods are supposed to be harvested during the apex of the sun equinox and then i think it's supposed to be grown in the winter equinox so that has if you see the nature of winter and summer that's yin and yang right so it's like the apex of yin and the apex of yang and that's kind of foods that gets this gets to harness uh shao yin right it gets to harness winter and summer heart and kidney that's shao yin right so it's kind of like the idea of image right uh, these are just other examples of foods, uh, and uh, this is just purely foods. Uh, this is raw foods, uh, shung foods. Uh. I mean, I have shung foods, uh, but I actually don't have it like this. I have shung foods of pian. So actually, uh, when I got raw foods, uh, um, they still slice it in pian, in slices, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, here we see that there is this little horn coming out of it, this jiao, out of this raw foods of this little horn. And here we see this concavity uh, out of the foods of this indentation, right? So that's part of the topography of the plant. Here we have the salty foods. Uh, you see that it's often not cut. Uh, and then we start to see the pian, right? See, here we see the slices. Uh, black foods uh, and white foods uh, and actually like i've i've seen uh, spring wind the foods that they sell uh is hayful pian often hayful pian um and this is how it looks it has this like almost this black tint around it right so that's um hay foods uh, uh let's see any questions so far okay hello lorraine Hello, Taquan. Hello, Lisa. Um, so types of major alkaloids found in the aconitum, uh, Carmichaeli. Now that's the one that is the foods, uh, because I think the, as I, sh as I showed you, um, my, the, where is it? The aconitum Kusnef Safi, I think that's the root hole. Um, now, it's, a, it's important to understand that uh, I'm only teaching the foods up most of the time here because when we talk about foods up, I'm also, you have to also think about Wu uh, even though, because we don't really use, remember there's three types of foods, as I said, foods up and all the different variants of foods up. There's the Wu the mother plant, and then the, the Tian Shung, which is like a specific type of, I believe, Wu over like five years or so. Um, so it changes the properties a bit because it's um, it's, old, it's older. And the idea is that that we're mostly going to talk about foods, uh, but uh, wuto is an important aspect of using aconite, right? So because we're talking about aconite, wuto food that does not replace wuto, but with wuto. Uh, you also have to be more, aware, more it's even more poisonous than uh, uh, than aconite. So, right, because foods are it's like the child of the of the mother root. So it's less toxic than the actual mother, right, which is has even more concentrated chemicals. So I'm not going to talk about wuto, uh, even though I do use it. Now, I don't use it myself as much as foods are. And I, I am every time I use it, uh, you know, I'm a little more cautious with using wood tool. I don't use it at high, crazy dosages um, because wood tool just has, from a uh, research standpoint, uh, or even a clinical standpoint, if you if you mine clinical literature of, of Chinese journals, uh, often it has the most <laughs> side effects in terms of clinical circumstances um, uh, if from a toxic standpoint. So I don't recommend using wood tool right away if you never use aconite. Uh, it's something that you begin to flirt with. Um, anyways, some of the major alkaloids found in the aconitum karma kelly plant are all these 
<laughs> ones. Now you're going to see that all of them are some variant of aconitine, right? So neo, uh, uh, mesaconitine, aconitine, right? Uh, carmicheline, uh, hypoconitine. So all these are different. These are just basically alkaloids, right? Um, and remember, alkaloids are basically plant chemicals that the plant has developed, uh, from my understanding, as a survival mechanism against predators. And of course, many animals don't even touch foods because they understand that it's toxic. So in a certain way, we humans are unique that we have harvested these toxic plants like aconite and sort of uh, gone against our na the natural in instinct or the natural instinct of uh, our animalistic instinct of not using these toxic plants. And we use them and made them medicinal. It's kind of cool from, from a survival standpoint. But anyways, since plants do not, cannot run, as we know, plants produce poisonous chemicals to prevent them from being uh, eaten or, you know. So uh, for aconite, that's in the form of this toxic alkaloids, uh, aconitine. So... Uh, so we use foods uh, again, we need to be aware of potential side effects, including the mechanism of actions of its toxicity. Um, so now let's, so the so symptomatology of the toxicity uh, will vary. Patients present predominantly with a combination neurological, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal features. Some have even used FUDSA as a method of suicide, right? So some people use FUDSA to, I know, to for suicidal intent. Now, um, I've also looked at, that, at those case records of, of it being used as a suicide tool. And I will tell you, it is not the most pleasant form of death um, that we when you, you could get. It is actually quite painful to be killed by FUDSA. Uh, so I don't know uh, why that it is even chosen chosen as a method of suicide since it's not a it is a very painful kind of uh, death, right? Um, so the neurological features can be sensory. Now I've never seen I've never ever seen any uh, toxic symptom from using foods uh, myself, so. Uh, this is just something to be aware of, but I've never seen any of this. But I have heard of certain practitioners uh, develop some of these symptoms. Uh, one of my teachers took foods uh, uh, and then he started to get a lot of the neurological features, paresthesias uh, in his four limbs, numbness in his face, Um but he knew what to do. He's a very, uh, he's a seasoned practitioner. So he understood that the foods up was not process, properly processed. Uh, so that's one feature that you have to be aware of uh, is the foods are properly processed. Uh, can I trust this foods up at higher dosages, right? Um, so you have to know where to get foods up. Uh, and I would make you uh, have research. Uh, I personally don't think there's just one company that sells good foods. Uh, I just don't believe that. And it's not my experience. So I don't advocate for any particular foods uh, myself, okay? Any brand of foods. Uh, uh, I just have experience of using certain types of foods, uh, but I don't advocate for any specific brand of foods, uh, okay? Um, so actually, I will tell you that anyone that's taught to tell that tries to tell you I have the only foods uh, that's pure and good, uh, they might have good foods. Uh, okay, they probably will do, but it's likely not the only good foods in the market. Okay, uh, you know because uh, Chinese do basically take uh, their foods. Uh, not every Chinese company, but uh, many do take it seriously. Okay, because they do see foods. Uh, as an important medicinal. Um, 
I don't, um, I'm not going to talk about any brand, okay, because um, I don't like to talk about brands. So uh, maybe ask me that question personally, but not here. Um, the cardiovascular features include hypotension, chest pain, palpitations, bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, ventricular ectopics, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. So that means that at this point, the food that has affected your heart, in particular, the electrical charge of the, of the heart. So uh, it's going to lead to palpitations or some type of heart uh, uh, rhythm issue. What in Chinese we call xinji, xinji, which means heart uh, palpitations. Um, the gastro feature, gastrointestinal feature, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Now imagine if you somebody that does try to use it for suicidal intent, uh, the person's face is going to start getting numb. Their limbs are going to start getting painful and cramping. Uh, they're not going to be able to walk, but they also are going to have the vomiting and nausea. So it's like they're trying to walk, but they can't even go to the bathroom. Then they start getting this uh, crazy heart rhythm, which starts as your heart starts to go faster, you start to sweat more rapidly which means yank collapse. So you could see this person is just like sweating a bunch of much, just having uh, intense abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, can't walk. So uh, it's not necessary. It's a very intense experience, I imagine. Um, but these are, I guess, features to be aware of. Now, I myself have never, ever seen any of this. So... Uh, but they can happen, okay? So they could happen. I, most of the time, um, it does not reach to death. Even if you get side effects, it does not reach to death, okay? The body can detoxify to some degree. But obviously, at that point, person should go to hospital. And um, from a Western standpoint, uh, the thing with aconite poisoning is not the most easy uh, thing to treat, actually, uh, it's not like there's one medicine to treat the foods of poisoning. Actually, to treat the foods of poisoning, especially when it reaches at the point of ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, or fibrillation, at this point of time, the only way the Western medicine tries to do is stabilize the heart. And for that, sometimes they use four or five drugs to try to stabilize the, the arrhythmias. So it's actually a very intense kind of treatment as well. Uh, so uh, not to s scare you, but in a way, a little bit, yes. <laughs> so, but often most people do survive, I believe. It has actually, uh, but at the same time, I, I never advocate anybody to get put in that situation. Um, so the mechanism of toxicity, uh, the cardiotoxicity and neurotoxicity of aconitine and related alkaloids are due to the actions of the voltage-sensitive sodium channels of the cell membranes of excitable tissues, including the myocardium, the nerves, and muscles. Aconitine and mesoaconitine bind with high affinity to the open state of the voltage-sensitive sodium channels as site. Therefore, thereby causing a persistent activation of the sodium channels, which become refractory to excitation. The electrical physiological mechanism of arrhythmia induction is trigger activity due to the late after depolarization and early after depolarization. The arrhythmogenic properties of aconitine are in part due to its uh, cholinolytic, anticholinergic cholinergenic effects mediated by the vagus nerve. Uh, so foods that affects the vagus nerves, basically, which affects the heart rhythm, right? Due to the electrical uh, uh, conductivity effects. So aconitine, aconitine is a positive inotropic effect by prolonging sodium influx during the action potential. So it makes the heart just kind of pump, 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 pump. It has hypotensive and brachycardiac actions due to its activation of the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. So it kind of makes the heart pump, but at the same time, it kind of has brachycardiac effects, hypotensive effects. So the heart begins to almost slow down, okay? Uh, 
though it's action on voltage sensitive sodium channels and axons, aconitine blocks neuromuscular transmission by decreasing the evoke quantum release of aceto uh, acetylcholine. Uh, and so on. So basically, can induce strong contractions through acetylcholine release from the postganglionic cholinergic nerves. Anyways, uh, that's just to maybe hear the science of aconitine effects, uh, a mechanism of its poisoning. Okay. So, anyways, um, I'm done with talking about toxicity, <laughs> but I think that that was an important aspect uh, disclaimer as well. To before you actually want to use foods, uh, uh, you are aware of it, okay? Note that while it's important to be aware of a potential side effects, in my clinical experience, I have administered foods uh, thousands of times, often having the patient cook it themselves, because I use a lot of times raw, but I've also used granules a lot, a lot, and probably around almost close to a thousand or more, of foods, uh, but I've used raw foods or more, um, not sh in, in bulk, I mean, when I say raw, in larger dosages than what is typically taught, and I have never seen any negative toxic reaction. Now, I have seen side effects from using foods uh, from misdiagnosis of myself to this patient, but that's very different when you get a side effect from foods uh, um, and it's not the right pattern. It's not the right time to use foods uh, on that patient. So you do get, you often get symptoms of fire in the upper burner. Um, but that is very different than a negative toxic reaction. That's just using foods uh, when it's not warranted on that person. Uh, but that can be, that can happen with any medicinal. Ginger can cause heat in the stomach if it's not warranted right um so same thing with foods um but i've never seen any negative toxic reaction after thousands of times using it in higher dosages so i can say with confidence that if one attains quality foods uh, and it is administered and cooked properly then chances of toxicity are very very low okay very very low i have also given foods up uh, just for reference like Who's this guy? I have used foods up to 200 grams per day, 200 grams per day. So I don't recommend you guys using 200 grams per day. And it's not like I typically use 200 grams um, consistently, but I have used it in some cases up to 200 grams and I don't have any issue using more. Um, but um, so it is quite safe if used properly. I don't know about the ounces. 200 grams is um, more than more than half a pound. Um, so yes, that is correct. If, uh, again, 200 grams, not 20 grams, 200 grams in Chinese. Um, anyways, I'm not recommending you guys use it at those dosages, okay? Anyways, uh, foods are contraindications. These are these are actually traditional contraindications, but um, um, foods are contraindicated with vancha, gualo, baimu, balian, baiji. Um, now, while some of these contradictions exist, I believe first introduced in Tao Tao Jing's compilation of the Shenong Ben Sao Jing. For those that don't know, uh, even though Shenong Ben Sao Jing is seen as kind of like a, a Han Dynasty text, ah, uh, it is not actually the edition we have is from the Han Dynasty, right? It was compiled or recompiled and organized by the. Uh, polymath um, Taoist Tao Hongjing and he has uh, various he other has he also has other material medicals like the Mingyi Mingyi Bielu the Mingyi Bielu but um, he also compiled to us a specific version of the Shenong Ben Sao Jing uh, and of course since he's Taoist he, he kind of like um, 
organizes it, organizes it to kind of fit his ideology, right? But um, uh, so yeah, so he's now these contradictions exist, but it is important to state that this country indications are not set in stone, okay? There's quite a number of times that John Jong Jing, which which I will say he is kind of like the father of Fuza or its usages, even though we see Fuza in kind of that um that text, the uh, uh the wushu the wushu being wushu being uh the 52 disease fang or the wushu being fang I think Right, the, I'll write it down, I believe. The wushu are being fang, or uh, which means kind of like the, or something like that, the 52 disease prescriptions uh, from the Ma Wang Dui, right, which is be before the, which is a burial site, right, which found a lot of uh, medical texts before a lot of the classics. So if you look at some of these prescriptions, and uh, for those that know Donald Harper, he helped translate some of these Mawandoi texts. Uh, he's from the University of Chicago, and I've actually met him. He actually one time uh, had a lecture that I attended. Uh, so uh, he talked about this Mawandoi text and also uh, Laguan text. Um, for those that know that burial site. But anyways, this Mawang Dui text, he translated that treatise, and you see that uh, Fuza uh, is using this Mawang Dui text. Now, the thing with this Mawang Dui text, it's kind of sort of, uh, I don't know if I got the right word, but in a certain way, it's a bit more primitive than Zhang Zhongjing, because Zhang Zhongjing has these perfect formulas that are kind of like... Uh, you know, that are fun, that have this, this, this direction to them, this diagnostic parameters to them. Whereas the Mawandwe usages of medicinals, it's kind of like you have this disease, you need this one or two herbs, right? The, the, the fang are usually like one or three herbs. Um, but it actually is quite interesting to look at this. So I'm not, I'm not actually downplaying Mawandwe of their texts. If you look at the um, uh, that the fifty two disease prescriptions or whatever the Wuxia or Bing Fang, uh, actually I will say it's good to you to look at it because um, sometimes we see usages that can be used in modern day. Um, so because a lot of times I will say even Zhang Junjing's knowledge of some of the medicinal properties likely come from that more uh, chaotic usage of the plant uh, or, you know, because that is more simple usages of the plant. You have this disease, so with th maybe this one symptom, so you give this plant without much pattern differentiation. Zhang Jing still, I think, extracted the usages or more of that folk usages of the plant or, you know, um, I don't want to say folk or whatever, but it might not be folk, but uh, and kind of adapted it to a diagnostic parameter that we know as the Liu Jing, as the six stages or the six warps or the six channels. Uh, and so uh, I will, uh, but Zhang Zhu Jing sort of kind of standardized when to use Fuzha. Um, but anyways, you see that Zhang Zhu Jing sometimes combines these medicinals that are contraindicated. And one example of that is when he uses Fuzha with Bancha, okay, Fuzha with Bancha. So he come in Fuzha, Fuzha Genmitan, Fuzha Genmitan. But he also combines sometimes Fuzha with uh, also, uh, then right here, Tianhua Fen, Tianhua Fen. So Gualo, Gualo Tzu, Gualo Pi, Tianhua Fen. These are all from the Trichosanthus of a plant. And uh, you see that this plant, um, you know, gualo and tianhofen, the root and the fruit and their seeds and the skin, foods is contraindicated with them, but uh, Zhang Zhujing sometimes combines foods with tianhofen. We see that in gualo chumaiwan, gualo chumaiwan, right? I'll write it down. Uh, oops. So that is a combination
of Fuza with Tiananmen. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so Fuza and Tiananmen. So, and then of course I said Fuza Gamitan, Fuza and Bansha. So is that a hard set rule that you cannot combine? And there's a doctor in China, I forget his name. Uh, one of my teachers was telling me about him. Um, but basically this doctor kind of challenges notions. So in a prescription, he will put all the contraindicated herbs uh, and give it to a patient. <laughs> the patient was fine. How, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm not recommending that, uh, but it's kind of <laughs> interesting the actual clinical reality of some of these contraindications. Um, I'm sure they have some degree of, of truth to them, though. Um, now, in China, from what I've been heard, in hospitals, if you do combine fuzha with bancha, fuzha with gualo or tianghefen, the because in China they have these electronic systems when you enter the prescription, and that system has actually safety mechanisms uh, that that you that you, that you basically sign off on if you don't fall, if you go over them or you bypass them. So if you do foods with this one of these medicinals, the electronic record will say, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And you kind of have to sign off on it. Uh, so uh, China does take it sort of seriously these contraindications. Or if you use foods at dosages that are more beyond the standard uh, health uh, recommendations or safety of hospitals which I, from what I heard from uh, Chinese doctors that I work with are around like 30 to 45 degree grams in Chinese hospitals. Um, now, some doctors use more, especially if they have a reputation, but they often have to sign off on it or they have special privilege. Um, because I think Bensky, uh, I don't know what, what's the highest dose that Bensky does, 15 or something, 20? Um, so yes, um anyways so now let's look at the what tcm has to say about foods uh, basic foods of functions uh, of course we're going to look at more foods uh, especially from other doctors who use foods a lot basic foods of functions nature and flavor sweet pungent greatly hot with toxicity um Honestly, uh, you know, flavors and natures change according to material medicals over time. So this idea of it being sweet, I don't know where that's from. Um, that's probably from, I'll have to mind the herbal text. But in older material medicals, you see it kind of be seen as mostly pungent. Because the idea of medicinals, and I think there are a few medicinals that have two flavors, in the Shenan Ben Sao Jing, like once, probably the ones you could count in one hand. But most medicinals have one flavor in the older Materia Americas. And uh, maybe Ming Yi Bien Lu by Tao Jing maybe has a little more. But most of the time, these Materia Americas have one flavor. And I think there's, um, I th the more flavors you combine, the more confusing sometimes I think you make the nature of a medicinal. So how is food so sweet, right? What does it, what sweet properties does it have um, that you will think foods are sweet? I can't really think of foods. I don't really conceptualize foods as a sweet medicinal. However, when you do take foods onto itself and taste it, even though there's uh, a pungent bitterness to it, like uh, acridity to it, there is kind of like an aftermath or, or not an aftermath, the aftermath will be kind of like a, a numbing kind of, uh, actually not numbing, at that point they're still kind of slightly toxic, but it's like this this bitter aftertaste that kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of stimulating. This, But when you first ha have it, 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 there is a sweetness to it, and I think there is uh, reason why they call it, some authors call it sweet. There is a sweetness to it. It is very mild though. It is not a sweetness, right? Because in Chinese herbal medicine, there's medicinals that are mildly sweet. 
moderately sweet and very sweet, right? Dad sauce, very sweet. Jerkan sauce itself is moderately sweet, but when you honey fry it, it becomes more sweet. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree that I would think of it as sweet, but uh, just be aware that medicinals and the classification of their flavor and nature changes. But no material medica disagrees that is pungent. None, that, none really disagree that is hot and none disagree that is toxic, right? Uh, that's the fundamental agreement. So whenever I look at a material medica or a medicinal plant and I try to understand the historical nature of it, what I do is, is look at what most uh, authors agree with, okay? Uh, and that to me will be like the base nature of the medicinal because uh, most major commentators agree that it's that. And then the difference is I often will, I will look at the doctor and I'll see why does he think that, right? Why does he think that? And, and then I'll try to contextualize it within the thought process of the doctor. And a good way to do this uh, for those that, uh, the good text to do that is the Ben Sao Gangmu by um, by Lee Leaders Leaders Jen right, and of course, uh, Paul Unschuld has translated uh, the Ben Sao Gangmu for us um, in English, um, and I think there was a special actually for those that are want that Ben Sao Gangmu. It's he's probably is the best. Well, there's other Ben Sao Gangmu in the market. Uh, by far, one likely can one say Paul and Schultz are the are the better ones. Uh, albeit, I don't have them myself, so I only have the uh, his dictionaries of the Benzal Gamu. So, but uh, I don't buy them because not because I don't want them, but uh, so there's the there's different volumes of them, and they kind of. Uh, a little expensive. So anyways, uh, if you're going to buy them, get the special. But I think he actually translated, uh, he has different volumes. And there's a volume on the toxicity, the poisonous plants. And of course, foods is there. So you can see the different commentaries and compare. So functions, return yang, rescue counterflow. Uh, of course, things already you know. Supplement fire and assist yang, disperse cold and stop pain. It is the primary medicinal to return yang and rescue counterflow. It's used in yin exuberance, repelling yang, uh, right? Da han wang yang, uh, great sweating from yang collapse, vomiting and diarrhea, reversal counterflow, cold limbs and faint pulse, cold pain of the heart and abdomen, cold, cold, cold. See, so you see that it's cold diarrhea, foot chi and water swelling. Uh, there's different interpretation of what foot foot chi is. Uh, I think Hillary Smith has uh, wrote a book on foot chi and the different ideas of what jiao chi is. Uh, but foot chi, uh, from what I remember, is you know in the Han like some type of uh, chi of the foot that begins to counterflow upward. And it's usually there's some degree of water and there's some degree of chi begins to counterflow upward to the through the leg to the point that it begins to go up the abdomen and into the heart. Um, uh, if you look at uh, Jingwei prescription, Shen Chi Wan has this foot chi. And I think some Wuto formulas treat foot chi. So, um, so there's wing, so it's a disease. It's an ancient disease. Okay, uh, there's wing cold damp impediment. So it treats all type of B. Uh, imp impotence, cold womb, bacuity, cold bowel, and diarrhea, external cold contraction, shang han. So uh, you can use it for colds when there is vacuity, right? Um, of the usually of the lower burner. Yin app, and that's an example of what? Ma Huang Fu Zi Xi Xin Tang. Ma Huang Fu Zi Xi Xin Tang. Or Ma Huang Fu Zi Gan Sao Tang. It's just three herbs, okay? And that treats, it has Ma Huang, low dosage Ma Huang usually, Fu Zi, and Xi Xin. 
uh, or gun sounds that are shishin to treat a cold contraction with yang deficiency at the root. But there's also usage other formulas like guaja and foods combinations, right? Guaja formulas for those that took my guaja course are used for zhong feng wind strike, right? And ma huang is for shanghan cold damage, right? Um, from a standard academic standpoint, but uh, some might disagree with that. And actually, John, there's points in Zhang Zhongjing where, where Ma Huang is used for Zhongfeng and Guizhou is used for, for Shanghai. So, but, but, point, but from a standard standpoint of a clinical uh, per, uh, paradigm, Guizhou is used for wind strike and, and Ma Huang is used for Shanghai. And then foods that can be combined with that if there's wind strike with yang deficiency, Guizhou foods. Are. If there's cold damage, with yang vacuity, ma huang foods, okay? And of course, ma huang formulas are going to be more tight pulls, right? And, and um, wage of formulas are going to be more floating and huan, more floating, fu huan, more floating and soft, floating and moderate, which means that there's a floating quality but there's no jin mai, there's no tight poles, right? The pose doesn't feel constricted and flat, right? Tight pose is usually kind of flat as opposed to a wiry pose. It feels like the artery, right? There's a, there's a tension to it, almost three-dimensionally, if you roll your fingers across that artery, but uh, there's no aggressiveness, uh, there, it could be actually sort of forceful, right? Floating tight and forceful, yoli, but it's there's no sharpness to it, right? It's like it doesn't cut your fingers, right? That's the wiriness, right? It's important to differentiate wiry and tight, actually. And sometimes tightness and wiriness can come together, actually. Um, and that's when the pulse feels uh, constricted three dimensionally, but on top of that, uh, constriction of the artery, then you feel the sharpness, right? Then you feel the aggressiveness of that pinpointness on your finger pads. Um, so yes. Thank you, Lorraine. So um, I don't have to say anything. Um, I think I actually will talk about that. Uh, we'll take a break soon, and actually, now we're actually delving into the Chinese medicine stuff, okay? So, also, by the way, this class probably will go past those two hours, okay? Um, because I usually prepare more material, and I want to go over it. So, uh, for those that uh, need to go those two hours, it's fine. It will be recorded, um, so you can just watch what's missing, or you haven't seen, but... I'll likely go over the two hours, um, okay? Uh, let's see, let me move this a little bit, okay? So you cannot talk about foods, uh, and I don't think anyone can talk about foods uh, if you don't talk about the emergency physician, Lika, okay, Lika. Um, Lika specialized in, I mean, emergency conditions, okay? And this emergency conditions include things like uh, stroke. They include things like um, uh, acute heart attack, right? They include things um, uh, where a person is acutely basically dying, okay? Um, so that means, so this idea of um, qi wei zhong zheng, right? This, uh, G way G means acute, way means kind of like perilous or dangerous, right? And Jong here means serious pattern. So, uh, and this this means um, uh, complicated, often too so complicated, or what we call naughty, and K N K N O T T Y diseases. So that's what he specialized in this this acute perilous series, this pattern, diseases, syndromes, symptoms, and complicated diseases, including cancers. 
uh, which can often become Jiwei, right? Um, so this is this is what Lee K specialized, and he wrote a whole book on this. Now, in this book, he doesn't necessarily tell you, I mean, he doesn't necessarily tell you his methodology. I must, he just tell you this this case, and I gave this. So it's almost like a way to inspire, but it's not a way to learn his methodologies. He has other books where you actually see his thinking process. Because often the problem with Lika is that some of his books don't really tell you his thinking process. They're more like, I did this, this person presented with this tumor, I gave this prescription. And this guy's prescriptions are crazy. It's like the craziest prescriptions I've seen in Chinese medicine are usually from Lika. Uh, but either way, I, 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 I don't recommend practicing like G Lika. Actually, it will be almost impossible to practice like Lika uh, because of the even his dosage parameters. The, the dosages he gives are are not only unfeasible from uh from a uh, from a comfort standpoint uh, i mean i likely i'm more comfortable with giving higher dosages but from a standpoint of how can, can a patient afford this <laughs> right uh, because the problem with uh, chinese medicinals that i'm seeing more and more and likely is going to become an issue more and more is herbs are becoming more and more expensive so that's something at the same time while i don't necessarily think uh physicians so necessarily uh think about price when they give a prescription at the same time we have to consider that can a patient afford uh, what i give them and and while they might afford it once or twice sometimes they'll need treatment long term and from a realistic standpoint, can a patient afford those things, right? I'm more of a nature that if I'm more on the moderate standpoint that I basically think that if a patient needs a prescription, that it's not necessarily my responsibility to think about if they will be to afford it, right? If a doctor or surgeon needs, if the person needs a surgery, then they need the surgery and it's not really the surgeon's worry to worry if the patient can afford it per se, or if the patient needs some drug. Now that's a, one standpoint. From another standpoint though, I do believe that you should have to some degree in mind, and this is what I learned from Chinese doctors, that uh, some of these older Chinese doctors that I work with who've been treating people for 30 years, and you know, first in Chinese hospitals before they came here, they, look at a patient and they kind of begin to, and I kind of done this too, they begin to ask the patient and you kind of get a sense of them and you can't always do it, but you kind of get a sense of them, of their economic, uh, I don't want to say status, but economic resources. And you kind of modulate your prescription in, re in, in reference to that. Now that's not always ideal because patients need prescriptions that go beyond their economic financial resources. And at that point, they have to find that way, especially if they can't afford something that I think is reasonable. But uh, it's just a skill to look at a patient, talk to a patient. And while you're making that, that small talk and getting to know your patient, you get a sense of their worries and, and status or, or comfort around spending money on herbs. I think it's a skill, and I think it's an important skill you develop. Uh, and that actually secures clinical results because you get to see, can this patient, are they going to be able to, what, what can I give that this patient could take sometimes long-term if they need that long-term, right? For a few months or so, or even for a few weeks. Um, so let's go Lika and Fuzza. For Lika, Fuzza is among herbs, the number one general, greatly pungent, greatly hot, greatly toxic, drives out cold toxin, breaks congealing yin, moving without guarding, penetrating and moving throughout the 12 channels, exterior, interior, inside, outside, without a place it doesn't reach. Its nature is like a thunderbolt, having the capacity to cut open and force open the gateway 
with the strength to break in and return again. Well, he's kind of poetically waxing here, uh, like uses the image of a thunderbolt. I mean, to some degree, the idea of a thunderbolt is, you know, Jen, kind of like, uh, or no, that's Lei, I believe, right? Jen Lei. That idea is the idea of kind of like the hexagram in the Yi Jing. And that hexagram, you know, I'm no Yi Jing expert, but that a hexagram is often related to kind of Xiaoyang, right? To Xiaoyang. And that idea of Xiaoyang has to do with resurrecting the Xianghuo, the ministerial fire. So even though Fuzha works on, on Xiaoyin, on the kidney, heart, the way that Fuzha ultimately penetrates and stimulates warmth throughout the body is through the Xiaoyang. Right, particularly uh, gallbladder senja, right, and it's because Fuzha works on the Junhuo, on the sovereign fire, on the Yuan Qi. But the way that Fuzha delivers its warmth is going to be through ministerial fire, okay? Because ministerial fire, Shanghuo, is contrasted to sovereign fire. And this two dynamic of sovereign fire and ministerial fire is basically the idea of when there's enough sovereign fire, that sovereign fire will be able to engender the movement of wood. And when the movement of wood happens, Xiaoyang, then that Xiaoyang wind and fire can spread throughout the body in a physiological sense, not in a pathological sense. Uh, we're going to see that the same that same mechanism. It's important to understand the mechanism of how stimulating Xiaoyin, the pivot of Yin, actually stimulates the pivot of Yang when the warmth of foods are distributes throughout the body. Right, Xiaoyin Xiaoyang connection, what is called a Sang Fu Bietong theory. Um, right, just when you uh, juxtapose the different. Uh, six channels, Taiyang with Taiyin, Yaming with Zhuiyin, and as we're talking about the two pivots, Xiaoyin with Xiaoyang, right? Yin and Yang. So Xiaoyang is the way that Xiaoyin kind of expresses its warm into the outside, into the exterior, into the channels. And Xiaoyin is how the Fuzha warm goes into the Zhang, into the viscera, okay? Um, but to move Yang, through, for example, when you're treating B obstruction and stuff like that, you need to stimulate Xiaoyang, okay? You need to go to the thunderbolt. You need to stimulate the movement of Yang to break yin, okay? What Su Wen Five says, says, uh, Song Yang, Yin Yin, right? From Yang, we leave yin, right? From Yang, we leave yin. That is, an, and Fuzha, I will actually tell you the Fuzha can has a has a mold, has a bidirectional effect. By what I mean is there's two mechanisms uh, I will say for all uh, medicines in Chinese medicine from a yin yang perspective. From yin, from yang, guide yin, and the other ones from yin, guide yang. Foods uh, can do both of these, I want to tell you. Generally, at the, and what is the way the foods uh, can do both of this? Depending on the dosage, okay? Depending on the dosage. If we're either affecting the Xiaoyang, right? The Yang, so that will be from Yang we guide Yin. For treating B obstruction, right? When it's going into the channels, into the Fu, into the exterior, we're using from Yang to guide Yin. But when we're treating the organ, the Xiaoyin, we're kind of going from yin to guide yang, right? From yin to guide yang. Or when we're using foods uh, for vacuity taxation, for shu lao, right? We're going to use the second principle. And the way foods uh, can do both of these is based on the dosage and ultimately what it's combined with, okay? What it's combined with. And that will have an effect 
am I pivoting Xiaoyang or am I pivoting Xiaoyin? Okay. Um, and that's basically, uh, to simplify further, that's basically, if I'm pivoting Xiaoyang, that means I'm putting the yang outside the organs. I'm moving the yang outside into the channels, right? Moving the yang exterior. And if I'm using Xiaoyin from yin to gai yang, I'm putting the yang into the organs inside the body, okay? And um, this is this is kind of also what Zheng Chenan, right? The fire god school dude, <laughs> um, founder of patriarch of the Hoshen Pai. This is what he calls basically uh, Kan and Li. And basically, if you look at his discussion of Kan and Li, with Yaren Seedman has translated, what I believe um, uh, someone else will translate one of the scrolls. Uh, Vita, I think, Vita, I forgot her uh, Italian um, scholar. Uh, you see that uh, Zheng Chenan tells you how to basically manipulate Kan and Li, which means fire and water. And it's basically what Su and Five tells you from Yang to Gai Yin, from Yin to Gai Yang. Except Zheng Chenan is addressing it and addressing it in, yi, in the language of the of the Book of Changes or the Zhou Yi, right? The Book of Zhou. So when you understand, begin the, when you begin to understand this Kan and Li, or from Yang to Gai Yin, or from Yin to Gai Yang, you begin to understand the full scope of Fuzo. Because if we look at most of these usages of Fuzo here, the standard usage of Fuzo, cold, 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 this is mostly using from Yang to Gai Yin, okay? It is not using from Yin to Gai Yang. And that is only understanding one aspect of Fuzo. It's only understanding half of the Tai Chi of Fuzo. Fuzo can affect both sides of the Tai Chi. When the, when the yang is too much, we can guide it back into the yin. Or when the yin is too much, we can bring back the yang, right? Uh, so Fuzha does both, okay? Uh, let's take a break, and then we'll begin on this, go to the some of the historical aspect of Fuzha and its popularity, okay? Let's take a, let's take a 12 minute break or so. And then we'll begin, OK? 